Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is David Carter. I'm the Director of Education and Outreach for Charleston Jazz. And uh, we're here with our good friend, Mr. Shannon Powell. Thanks to Larry Blumenfeld for helping us out with this uh, through Spoleto Festival USA. Uh, Mr. Blumenfeld, do you like to take it from here? Sure. Uh, hi, Larry Blumenfeld. I'm here in Brooklyn, over in one, in another one of these, uh, these Hollywood Square Squares is Shannon Powell in New Orleans, Louisiana. I guess everyone's in Charleston, everyone else in Charleston, South Carolina. I <coughs> could be coming to Charleston for the annual Spoleto Festival USA. And a few years ago, when I started uh, putting together the, jazz, the Wells Fargo Jazz Series there, I got together with David Carter and I said, hey, some of these great jazz musicians should come down and do some workshops for your students. And David said, let's do it. And then ever since, he's been making it happen the way he makes so many other things happen. Um, so the first time I met this man, Shannon Powell, was in New Orleans in 2006. And I want you to understand that in 2006, amid utter devastation from the floods that followed the levee failures that resulted from havoc, Hurricane Katrina, there was Shannon Powell at Donna's, a club that doesn't exist anymore, at his drum set, welcoming different musicians and playing all night long. Most of those musicians weren't even living back in New Orleans yet. And there was Shannon Powell pretty much announcing, this is our culture, this is how our rhythm goes, and we are back. Um, many people in New Orleans know Shannon Powell as the King of Treme because he was born, born and raised in the Treme neighborhood. In the house that I'm in right now. That's right. That's the same house, right? Same house I'm in right now. Right. And Treme is a Treme. neighborhood. Treme, is, is, there, is there any neighborhood that we could say is more essential to the culture that you come from right now than Treme? Not really, not really. Treme is, is the heartbeat of New Orleans uh, culture and neighborhoods. This is like the avenue of all the neighborhoods in New Orleans, the Treme. Very musical and historic. Uh, I was so fortunate to be able to come from this neighborhood. And who were, who were before we get into drumming, who were some of the musicians that, that you soaked up this tradition from? Well, I was fortunate to be born right here in the same block with the great drummer Earl Palmer, who lived in this block before I was born. And right around the corner, two of the greatest drummers that ever lived, the, uh, the late, great Smokey Johnson and uh, the great Mr. John Boudreau, another great drummer from North, they both lived right around the corner. Not to, not to uh, mention uh, the great Mr. Jim Robinson, who's a traditional trombone player, one of the best in the world. Uh, uh, Alphonse PQ, who lived around the corner and had a club right around the corner. The whole neighborhood was just flooded with top-notch great New Orleans musicians. By the way, which was the tail end of New Orleans, a lot of these musicians that were around when I came up as a kid, I kind of caught the tail end of real, real New Orleans and what the neighborhood was about. Because it's changed drastically since that. <laughs> yeah. I would say... There aren't that many of the musicians that make the music that you make still actually living in Treme anymore. Well, right? that's why I call myself, I'm self-called the king of Treme. <laughs> not many people understand that because the people are so late in bloom and they're so, they're such a late bloomer around here. The lot of people that live around here or that just visit around here, they don't really know the, the neighborhood or the culture. So that they, they wouldn't know because a lot of them even come to how can you call yourself the king of Treme? I said, well, you got to seek that out. I am actually the oldest living musician in the Treme right now. You know, not the oldest that's living. I said the oldest that's living in the Treme mm -hmm. right now. And when no. I was a kid, I was, you know, <laughs> there were tons of them. Who were, who were the musicians that you worked with when you were coming up who taught you the well, most about how New Orleans music works rhythmically? Well, as I mentioned to people all over the world when I do interviews, I give all praises to Danny Barker and Alan Jaffe. Alan Jaffe is a great man that, that owned the Preservation Hall and who came to New Orleans and started Preservation Hall 
back in the 60s, I mean the 50s before I was born, 10 years before I was born, he opened up Preservation Hall. And as I, as he came to the Crimea neighborhood, he discovered me playing drums in my house as a kid and kind of put me under his wings and brought me to the Preservation Hall to hang out with some of the greats like Louis Barberin, the great drummer, or the brother of the great Paul Barberin, or Saeed Frazier, you know, Sammy Penn, Joe Watkins, Freddie Coleman, all these great musicians, and the, the Humphrey brothers, Percy and Willie Humphrey, and Sweet Emma Barrett, you know, and Mr. Jaff used to always send different people from all over the world to, to my house to film me, because at that time, in the 70s, I was the only kid in the Trimme playing music. There weren't any kids around here playing music mm -hmm. back then. I was the only kid, you know, playing music in the Trimme in the 70s. So, mm -hmm. you know, I was being filmed by by Japanese, Germans, or uh, 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 English film people came. And Mr. Jaffe had a lot to do with that. He encouraged me as a kid to go on further because I was really stuck on trans music because that's the music I really come up on listening to in the Treme all my life was traditional New Orleans brass band music mm -hmm. and New Orleans traditional sit-down music. So that's pretty much all the music that they had around here back then as a um, kid. And I kind of fell in love with that until I met Mr. Barker. Um, if, if people, if everyone else doesn't mind, and Shannon, if it's okay with you, we're not we're you're much you look much further away than the rest of us and it's a little hard to see what you, your face and what you're doing would it be possible for you to take come and move your your ipad so that it's turned to the side so you're horizontal instead of vertical just like yeah that's where i had that person until, that's the way i had that person until you came on and you wasn't like that oh see if you and can do it and see if you can get it Make it a little closer too, if you don't mind. When we do the recording, we edit this. Is that okay with everyone? I need to see him. Yep. Okay. 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 So okay. okay. You be able to see his hands. Right. He want to see me a little closer. He want to go back to where you had started. Okay. Or or yeah, we want to be able to see you. So, Shannon, I've heard you play so many times in so many situations. Maybe let's get right into into talking about rhythm. So um, we have students who play a variety of instruments here. And what can you, can you just show them, give them a little idea of what are the basics that really let you know you're in New Orleans to the beats, the rhythms that really announce that this is New Orleans music? Well, pretty much the traditional style of playing drums in New Orleans is what we call the second line rhythm. And the second line rhythm, you can play that on drums on most of all the trad music that's ever recorded or played today because it's a, it's a standard rhythm that you play. And it can be played several ways. Uh, uh, for instance, I can show you uh, the way I learned how to play as a kid. And then as I grew older, I started developing other ways to open what you call open up and play with the rhythm. But this is pretty much the way we played when I was coming up. And that's a pretty standard way of playing traditional music. And when you hear the songs, like when I do when I when I when I practice, I always hum. To myself because that's the way I learned how to, to play, to learn how to play with dynamics. If you hum to yourself as a drummer and play, you will learn how to play soft as a player loud because anybody can play loud, but to play soft and be effective is very, very hard. So that's why you gotta play like this. Ba -ba -ba, ba -ba -ba, ba -ba -ba. Thank <laughs> you. 
Because that's the uh, pretty standard way of playing New Orleans style trad music. But now I'm 58 years old and I have learned to kind of decorate the groove a little bit more <laughs> as opposed to playing straight and like the older guys who I learned it from. All right, because that's okay to do with music. You can learn how to play one way and then as you gradually play it, and learn, you open up and start playing a little bit more. Like, bop, 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 Days because, like I said, as I grew older and started hearing other great drummers like Smokey Johnson and, 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 and Walter Poppy Lassie, who was the uncle of the great Hurl Riley, and they were playing different rhythms as opposed to where I learned to play. <laughs> people that they can play that style. So I don't get a chance to really play like that no more. Real mm -hmm. authentic, old style New Orleans music. I don't, the only time I get a chance to play like that when I'm playing with Dr. Michael White. Right. You know, yeah, uh, 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 you know, people like that. You know, people that, 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 that live to play that style of music. You know what I'm saying? That's why it's so, it's so, it's so, it's such a pleasure for me to work with him and to be able to play and, and it kind of brings me back to when I was coming up as a kid playing trade New Orleans music, you know. Now, now, when you're doing that, when you're doing that style, you're really putting together things that originally were, or even now in a parade, would be done by a few different drummers, like one bass That's drummer, right. another That's guy, right. and a snare drum player, and a bass drum player. And, and, and like I said, because time has changed, the kids today, they have their own way of playing trad music, which is much a little more funkier than what they played when I was coming up, and it's understandable yeah. because I was listening to the, the like I said, I was listening, I was fortunate to have caught the tail end of real New Orleans and what it's you know those a lot of these kids missed out on that on a lot of the things that I saw and heard. A lot of the kids today they missed out on that. And it's a misfortune thing for them mm -hmm. because they should have been able to hear and see the correct way of playing New Orleans, New Orleans style set line. Because you got to also remember in the brass band back then, brass band in, in, back in, 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 the, in, 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 in years ago were only used for social and pleasure club parades or a jazz funeral. You know what I'm saying? Back then, that's the only time you can really see a brass band. Today, brass bands are all over. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, here I go. Yeah. You know. So, so now, when, I, I don't know if there's a good answer to this question, but, but you know, someone like Herlin Riley, who, of course, is your, 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 your buddy and collaborator and another great... That's one of my mentors. Now, someone like Herlin, of course, Herlin also plays in what we might call modern jazz situations. Yeah. Is there, yeah. Is, there, is there a way you can describe the difference between 
how you handle the bass drum, how you handle the snare drum in, in traditional New Orleans music and how that compares to how you would do it in, in a modern jazz situation? Yeah, you know, well, you see, the, the way that came about is, is the, the bass drum became, was playing on four all the time. Went back then, like that. But as time changed, you start playing with the hi-hat. See, because you got to remember, the hi-hat didn't come in to the 50s. Okay. You understand? The hi-hat really wasn't that important. Everything was snare drum, ride cymbal, and bass drum. So when they swung, everything was like this. I five two young cats today that all of the swing is in the cymbal, to be honest with you. You know, if you can't swing on the cymbal, then you ain't going to be able to swing. You know what I'm saying? Because this is where the swing is at. That's where it's at. That's where it's on and everything. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now, that's just a symbol. Now, when I put the folk on the bass drum, watch how full that sounds. See that? I'll tell you, the sound quality is, we're having some problems with the sound quality here, but even so, you can hear, right? You can really hear what he's doing to the beat, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, I hope you can. What, you, what kind of sound problem you have on my end? We're, lo yeah, we're losing a little bit of stuff, but I don't know what we could do about it. Um, but, I mean, it still comes across. So let me ask you, what you're doing is, is can you give people an idea of how you use the whole drum kit when you're really embellishing those beats? Yeah, well, that's what I'm getting ready to show you, the difference between playing that style and playing more modern. Yeah. Now, without the, without the bass drum, I'm going to play the hi-hat now and show you the difference. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, no, I, man, I feel like you. I feel like you took us, moved 80, 80 years forward in time, went across an ocean, came back, and then went back the same eighty years. But that right. was incredible. So now right. I want to let anyone else, anyone have some questions for Shannon? Anything you want to yeah. ask, Shannon? Mr. Brooks, you wanna? I think you have some really cool business-related questions. You wanna go ahead and knock yours out? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Shannon, I appreciate you taking the time. I'm, I'm a big fan. I'm a drummer as well. Studied at a college in Charleston, or Quentin Baxter in Charleston, South Carolina. So um, definitely have a special, special love for your playing, for sure. Thank you, dude. Uh, so I wanted, you know, I'm curious, you know, I'm always teaching my, trying to teach my students to get in the, um, the, the habit of practicing, you know what I'm saying, regardless of the style of music that we happen to be going over. But the habit of practicing so that when the time comes for the, like, the opportunities you got to you know, they can now focus on the business side of, of getting the gig and keeping the gig, right? So um, one thing I want to ask you is, do you have any, um, <laughs> kind of things here, do you have any, any advice to students on how to, to encounter the business part, the business side of music, you know, talking to people, how to present yourself, you know what I'm saying? After the work in the, in the, uh, in the practice room, not as done, but as you got to a certain point, now it's time to say, hey, I'm ready for the gig. How do I start doing that? How do I start networking? Yeah, well, you know, the, 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 the number one thing, my man, is to encourage them to stay on a professional level and on the professional side because everything is not just planned, as you said. You know, once you get to plan and you start getting opportunities to make gigs, then you have to present yourself as a professional man, not as a musician, because you got to remember we're men first and ladies. We, we, we're, not, we're not musicians, we're men and women first. So we have to respect ourselves as human beings to make others respect us as well. And then after that, your talent should speak for you there. You know, all the hard work you put in and studying to be uh, the professional that you are, that's when you, you have to, that's when that steps in. You know what I'm saying? You have to have a, a competence in yourself too. You have to, you have to be your, your worst is a, a, a critic, you know, at all times. You know what I'm saying? And, 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 and most of the time, man, you got to stay focused on the business side of it because these days, as you mentioned, it's not just playing, it's business too. And sometimes if your business side ain't together, you can lose out. So, you know, mm -hmm. think about that and staying encouraged and, staying in, and learning more and more about the business too. You know, like you're going to get some books 
and learn about being professional and learn how to, you know, uh, 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 learn, learn different wages on prices of gigs and things like that. You know, recordings and, you know, learning, learning the business, you know. Yeah. yeah, I appreciate that. So always, always staying a student. Absolutely. Yeah, man. You know, once you once you learn how to play, then then you know it should be automatic that you should want to be professional with your wardrobe and things like that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I have a problem with a lot of musicians here in New Orleans. The young kids that they don't want to keep that. They don't want to wear that tie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they don't want to suit up. But uh, you know. Things like that. Nice question, though. Thank you. Thank you. TJ? Yeah. So one thing I was wondering, so the people from your area, whenever you were growing up in the Treme neighborhood, were a lot of these, was there any kind of formal training going on in these areas? Or did people just kind of pick up musical instruments from people around them and what they could find, you know, all that kind of stuff? Well, there was always formal training. When I was a kid, I, I, I never had formal training around here. I learned how to play in school when I went to junior high school and high school. But as a kid, I just picked up playing the drums because of the brass bands that were passing in front of my door every day. I just took a liking to the drums and the rhythms, you know. And then also I grew up next door to what we call a sanctified church. And there were a lot of women in there playing tambourines. Unbelievable. They have never been to school for music in their life. They just were playing the tambourine with, with, with so much uh, 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 rhythm and feeling from their heart, you know, just God-given talent, you know what I'm saying? And I kind of picked up some of that stuff, you know, like, like, like playing like this. same tambourine style that they were playing in the church was the same style that they played at Mardi Gras Indians. Mm -hmm. See? Same rhythm. <laughs> coming up as a kid, like I said, until I went to school and started learning how to read and things like that. But most of the stuff that I learned was straight from the streets, man. Watching other people, you know. So did, a lot, going of stuff. Me. Did, no, did a lot of stuff did a lot of stuff come to you more naturally after being surrounded by those kind yeah. of things so yeah. often? Yeah. Very much so. Very yeah. much. That's why I tell a lot of students when you're learning something, after you learn it, you have to turn it into a pulse. In other words, you can't continue to count all the time. You have to turn some of the stuff that you learn. It has to become natural. After you learn it and you practice only so long, you have to become a pulse. You know, like when you're counting different rhythms, you know, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, You got to, you know, it's got to, it's got to be something in you now. You got to come out with, you know. You know, once you learn how to play five, you got to play all inside and outside that five. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah, you can't just play one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, three four, five. You can't just do that. You got to hold it up. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's awesome, man. Thank you. I appreciate you taking the question. Thank you. JT, uh, JT, and then Chase, and then we'll bring back around to Mr. Blumenfeld. Sorry. When, um, when like interacting with like a rhythm section or even like horn players, like what, what do you expect from them? And like, what do you want as far as interaction goes? Cause there's, there's a ton of interpretations for different drummers, but I'm, I'm kind of curious, like from a new Orleans perspective, I suppose. Well, when I'm playing with, with, with a band, uh, most of the time, I'm, 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 I'm concentrating on the rhythm section. I don't too much listen to horn players because horn players play a lot. Some of them play right, some of them play wrong, and they play <laughs> long and wrong. Yeah, they play long and wrong. So I don't too much listen to horn players when they play a the solo. I, play, I listen for the piano and the bass, you yeah. know what I'm saying? And I concentrate on the form of the song so I can you know, know where I'm at in case the horn player doesn't. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So you know, it's right. always good to to uh, like I was telling my students, it's always good to play soft as a drummer as opposed to playing loud because, like I said, anybody can play loud, but to play soft and play effectively in soft is very hard to do. But it's it's very good for the dynamics and, and, and to be tasty. You know, you want to be a tasty drummer. You don't want to be a sloppy loud drummer that's just playing and bashing and crashing cymbals and things. You mm. want to play most closely to the to the to the melody of the song. So you can almost sound like you're playing melodies on the drum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I don't too much listen to horn players, man. And I, that's not in a bad way. I mean I love some some I know some great horn players that I play with, you know, in the years that I've been out here. But uh I, I don't concentrate on uh pretty much horn solos when they play. Yep, no, no problem with that. I try to make them sound good, though. Yeah, you know, yeah absolutely. Keep the groove up, you know, and keep the pace of the music up so they can sound good. And hope they don't wear me out. <laughs> hey, Chase, you want to ask the last question? Yeah, I, I saw that you started drumming in church, and I want to know how much of an influence that had as you were growing up and how much the influence has now on your playing? So much, man, because like I said earlier, growing up in the church, it gave me an opportunity to play with a hundred piece choir. Uh, when I was about 13 years old, I was a drummer for a choir that was a hundred pieces. And that's where I really learned how to use my dynamics and use mallets and brushes yeah. and things like that. So when I became a professional musician and I started playing an orchestra with Harry Connick, I kind of was prepared for that melodic part of the music, using brushes and mallets and things like that, because I came out to playing with the choir years ago. And even before I played with the choir, like I was telling the other student, uh, I pick up the tambourine feeling from these old ladies in church that were just, you know, unbelievably talented women that had never been to school for music or nothing. They're just playing all these rhythm from their heart, you know what I'm saying? And uh yeah. I, I kind of picked that up in uh you know Earl and Riley, his grandfather had a church in New Orleans, it was somewhat similar to the one that go to me. And uh they used to play the same they used to uh, uh, worship God the same way and I used to go around that and uh that's when I met Herlin and his uncles, and, and they got a special, special, special feeling for that tambourine thing, man. It's unbelievable. And we kind of caught, we kind of mixed it, me and Herlin, kind of mixed the tambourine playing in our, in our uh, music when we playing with bands and things. There's certain songs you can use the tambourine on that gives a lot a great rhythm, you know, that, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Blumenfeld? 
All right. Listen, I, I can't thank everyone enough. Um, thank you. Those very good questions. Thank you, David, for putting this whole thing together. And Shannon, I can't believe how much you gave us. You gave us a, a semester's worth of education and a concert. Thank so, you. Um, I look forward well, to Well, um, you give all you give all them all them students my number, uh Larry, if they have any questions or they want to talk and do lessons on Skype, I do lessons on Skype too. Okay. Um listen, I you know, with any luck, we'll be hearing you play in Charleston next year, and I look forward to seeing you in New Orleans soon. Thank you so much, Larry. You're looking good, by the way, man. You're looking good. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, everyone else Thank uh, you, everyone. that joined in. Thanks, Shannon. I appreciate it. Definitely, definitely be contacting me for a lesson. Thank you. Yeah, everybody man. have a great day. So